Chapter Thirteen of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in December two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Thirteen, the Sword, the Soul of the Samurai. From these bloody institutions, as well as from the general tenor of Bushido, it is easy to infer that the sword played an important part in social discipline and life. The saying passed as an axiom, which called the sword the soul of the samurai, and made it the emblem of power and prowess. When Mahomet proclaimed that the sword is the key of heaven and of hell, he only echoed a Japanese sentiment. Very early, the samurai boy learned to wield it. It was a momentous occasion for him when at the age of five he was apparelled in the paraphernalia of samurai costume, placed upon a go-board and initiated into the rites of the military profession by having thrust into his girdle a real sword instead of the toy dirk with which he had been playing. After this first ceremony of adoptio per arma, he was no more to be seen outside his father's gates without this badge of his status, even if it was usually substituted for everyday wear by a gilded wooden dirk. Not many years pass before he wears constantly the genuine steel, though blunt, and then the sham arms are thrown aside, and with enjoyment keener than his newly acquired blades, he marches out to try their edge on wood and stone. When he reaches man's estate at the age of fifteen, being given independence of action, he can now pride himself upon the possession of arms sharp enough for any work. The very possession of the dangerous instrument imparts to him a feeling and an air of self-respect and responsibility. He beareth not his sword in vain. What he carries in his belt is a symbol of what he carries in his mind and heart, loyalty and honor. The two swords, the longer and the shorter, called respectively Daito and Shoto, or Katana and Wakitashi, never leave his side. When at home, they grace the most conspicuous place in study or parlor. By night, they guard his pillow within easy reach of his hand. Constant companions, they are beloved and proper names of endearment given them. Being venerated, they are well nigh worshipped. The father of history has recorded as a curious piece of information that the Scythians sacrificed to an iron scimitar. Many a temple and many a family in Japan hoards a sword as an object of adoration. Even the commonest dirk has due respect paid to it. Any insult to it is tantamount to personal affront. Woe to him who carelessly steps over a weapon lying on the floor! So precious an object cannot long escape the notice and the skill of artists, nor the vanity of its owner, especially in times of peace, when it is worn with no more use than a crozier by a bishop or a sceptre by a king. Shark skin and finest silk for hilt, silver and gold for guard, lacquer of varied hues for scabbard, rob the deadliest weapon of half its terror, but these appurtenances are playthings compared with the blade itself. The swordsmith was not a mere artisan, but an inspired artist, and his workshop a sanctuary. Daily he commenced his craft with prayer and purification, or, as the phrase was, he committed his soul and spirit into the forging and tempering of the steel. Every swing of the sledge, every plunge into water, every friction on the grindstone, was a religious act of no slight import. Was it the spirit of the master or of his tutelary god that cast a formidable spell over our sword? Perfect as a work of art, setting at defiance its Toledo and Damascus rivals, there is more than art could impart. Its cold blade, collecting on its surface, the moment it is drawn, the vapors of the atmosphere. Its immaculate texture, flashing light of bluish hue, its matchless edge upon which histories and possibilities hang, the curve of its back uniting exquisite grace with utmost strength, all these thrill us with mixed feelings of power and beauty, of awe and terror. 
Harmless were its mission if it only remained a thing of beauty and joy. But, ever within reach of the hand, it presented no small temptation for abuse. Too often did the blade flash forth from its peaceful sheath. The abuse sometimes went so far as to try the acquired steel on some harmless creature's neck. The question that concerns us most is, however, did Bushido justify the promiscuous use of the weapon? The answer is unequivocally no. As it laid great stress on its proper use, so did it denounce and abhor its misuse. A dastard or a braggart was he who brandished his weapon on undeserved occasions. A self-possessed man knows the right time to use it, and such times come but rarely. Let us listen to the great Count Katsu, who passed through one of the most turbulent times of our history, when assassinations, suicides, and other sanguinary practices were the order of the day. Endowed as he once was with almost dictatorial powers, repeatedly marked out as an object for assassination, he never tarnished his sword with blood. In relating some of his reminiscences to a friend, he says, in a quaint plebeian way peculiar to him, I have a great dislike for killing people, and so I haven't killed one single man. I have released those whose heads should have been chopped off. A friend said to me one day, you don't kill enough. Don't you eat pepper and eggplants? Well, some people are no better. But you see that fellow was slain himself. My escape may be due to my dislike of killing. I had the hilt of my sword so tightly fastened to the scabbard that it was hard to draw the blade. I made up my mind that though they cut me, I will not cut. Yes, yes, some people are truly like fleas and mosquitoes and they bite, but what does their biting amount to? It itches a little, that's all. It won't endanger life. These are the words of one whose Bushido training was tried in the fiery furnace of adversity and triumph. The popular apothegm, to be beaten is to conquer, meaning true conquest consists in not opposing a riotous foe, and the best won victory is that obtained without shedding of blood, and others of similar import, will show that after all the ultimate ideal of knighthood was peace. It was a great pity that this high ideal was left exclusively to priests and moralists to preach, while the samurai went on practicing and extolling martial traits. In this they went so far as to tinge the ideals of womanhood with Amazonian character. Here we may profitably devote a few paragraphs to the subject of the training and position of woman. End of chapter 13